I'm Stephen Mucher, and I'm director of credentialing programs at UC Berkeley Extension. We're so uh, happy you're here. We welcome you uh, to our teaching series, uh, Teaching Across Screens. We hope you will look at uh, the other events we have coming up and join us for those. Uh, but today, we really want to get right down to business. These workshops last for one hour, and we want to move right into it. So I'm going to start with two announcements and then introduce us briefly to John Bow, our speaker today. Um, first is, as many of you are already doing, we want to make sure um, you take a moment just to tell us a little bit about you, uh, where you're teaching, what you're doing. We got some insight from your survey previously, but this is also a way that the group as a whole can see who's participating in this workshop. Um, and secondly, as questions arise, what we've decided to do, given the size of this group, is to have questions uh, kind of accumulated and addressed at the end. And I think Mr. Bo also has some potential plans to engage with you after the workshop's over too, um, if you're interested. Um, so that'd be very helpful and make sure you take a moment to do so. Um, but with that, I'm going to briefly and incompletely uh, introduce John Bo to you. He is an author of a book that came out just last week. Uh, I have something to say. I think he'll give us the subtitle. He'll also give us more on uh, the, his biography and the background behind the book as part of his presentation. So I'm not going to do any more um, introduction of that book or John Bow, and I'm just going to turn it right over to him. Thank you, John, for joining us. Thanks, Stephen. Um, and hello, everyone. I'm really honored to be here for a discussion of the problems that you're facing. I don't think anyone can imagine what you guys are up against and in a week or two you're going back into it. So for me to be included in a discussion that might be helpful with those problems is it makes me feel very honored and I hope that I'm useful. Um, I'm going to break this talk into three parts and the first I'll say a little bit about me and my book and how I discovered this weird subject of ancient Greek techniques of public speaking, because it's about the least cool thing that anybody could write a book about right now. Secondly, I'd like to talk about the feedback that I got from you all and from educators around the country, speaking to what you're up against. And it was really, really bracing, specific and sad and challenging to hear it. Just the granular specifics of it were it really floored me. And I'd like to bring those back around to these weird Greek principles of public speaking because I think that they might be kind of helpful. And then in the third part, I'd like to talk about a lot of the solutions that people offered me. And by myself, I'm not smart enough to implement them, but my hope is that by the time we roll around to the Q&A at the end, you all can figure out ways to take them a step further and implement them yourselves. So really what I am is the guy, the theorist, the guy who knows all the Greek stuff that can help guide a good discussion of how to solve some of these problems. But between all of you, you already have a lot of the answers. So one of the big things I heard in the feedback was the problem with online speaking and teaching and everything else is reading the room. And so in an effort to read the room, I'd like to kick off a, a breakout session where everyone gets into little groups of and take three or four minutes to just come up with some adjectives describing how you're feeling going back to the, I don't even want to call it a classroom. I don't know what to call it anymore, but how are you feeling? Don't worry if it's dark. Don't worry if it's, you know, negative seeming, but just, we're not here to be pretty. We're here to come up with a solution. And then I would like one person in each little group to be the scribe who then writes it down, just one, two, three adjectives, whatever, and kicks it back to us over the chat function. So if we could do that and meet back here in three or four minutes, thank you. Okay, is everybody back? I'm reading, I'm reading everybody's uh, introductions about where they're from. We've got Washington, Mexico City, Florida, Michigan, New York City in the house but I don't have any adjectives from everyone describing what we were looking for. Oh, wait a minute, we got some positive, we got some not terrible, we've got some anxious, fatigued, worried, not sustainable. That was kind of more what I was fishing for. Um, well, okay, good. So I wanna, I mean, I'm glad that it's a little frazzled, juggling so many needs, isolated, stressed, anxious, overwhelmed, terrified, possibilities rather than challenges, overwhelmed, 
excited, nervous. So, okay, we have a mix. We have a mix. Um, like most people here, I had never heard of Zoom before March of this year. I had used Skype a lot and WhatsApp video to chat with friends and family, but I'd never had to do any kind of public speaking over a video monitor. And I wanna make the distinction of what is public speaking since that's what my book is about. Um, my book, by the way, the subtitle that Stephen dropped the ball on was, um, I have something to say, mastering the art of public speaking in an age of disconnection. And I'll tell the story in a minute of what made me want to write about that and why. But anyway, before that, I never had to do much public speaking. And so my definition of public speaking is not just everyday talking, which is, you could argue that that's public speaking as well. But for me, it's when you have an agenda, you have a program, you have an organized set of facts, stories, whatever that you want to transmit from your head or your heart or whatever into other people's. You can't just babble, you can't just talk, you're not just going back and forth and improvising. You've got a plan, you've got a flight plan. And when the pandemic started, an architect friend of mine said, in the context of my book, she said, God, this, uh, this Zoom, it's so terrible because now everyone and everything is public speaking. And her point was that you can't just show up to a Zoom and be yourself. You have to be something different than yourself, this more focused, prepared version of yourself. And it's a nightmare for most people. And it's a nightmare for me. Um, the other day, <laughs> I had to do a, a speech, a recorded video talking about my book for the Toastmasters Club. And they are very, very finicky about public speaking. If you have a gap or a hiccup or a little slowness in your transition from part two to three, like they are on it. So I was pretty nervous and they said, 10,000 to 20,000 people are gonna see this and you need to make it look very good. You need to do it perfectly. So I wrote and practiced my speech for probably 30 or 40 hours for a 20 minute speech because I wanted it to be perfect. And at the last day they said, great, let's do a technical run through. And so we set the screen up now, but behind me, I had a virtual background and I had this light, which if you see in front of me, you can see these reflections on my glasses. And they said, oh, no, 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 Like, we got to get rid of that. Now, I'm staying in a house in Western Massachusetts in the Berkshires. It's not my house. And so one thing I had to do was cover all the windows with sheets. And I didn't know where the sheets were. So I had to run around and find the sheets and cover every single window and then find the push pins. And then I ran out of push pins and I had to find nails. And then I couldn't find a hammer. And so I had to get this, which I found in a closet downstairs and use this for a hammer to be hammering the nails. And then all of the sheets got cobwebs on them from resting on top of the window. So, so it was six hours extra time to get this thing out of my glasses. And the whole time I was just screaming saying, I'm a writer, this isn't my job. This isn't my job. <laughs> I don't wanna be a lighting person. I don't wanna be a director of photography. That's not why I got into this. And it was, it was six hours. And I, I had less time to rehearse my speech because I was worrying about a reflection in my eye. And for my set of values, content is everything and appearance is nothing. And it completely pissed me off. And I realized, wow, this is what everyone's going through. And on some level, it reflects the comments that I heard back from all of you, which is just kind of, we didn't sign up for this. We don't know how to do this. We're not able to do our jobs as effectively and one of the bottom lines, one of the bad news things that I have to tell you is like spending that extra time to make the technique of this whole thing work is just part of the deal. Um, anyway, that's all by way of introducing my talk. What I really wanna start with is a rundown of some of the comments that I got. Because again, I thought that they were, they, I was very floored by reading them. It was kind of impressive and depressing. And so the biggest, the second biggest complaint was the technical stuff. And I think that could be captured. Someone said fluidity using tech. And that referred to on the teacher side, but also the student side, there's no universal, you know, everybody has the same equipment and everybody knows how to use it. And in the absence of that, you never know what they're getting. Everyone's focusing on a lot of other stuff besides just learning and hearing the message. Um, but the biggest problem by far 
was, you know, going back to what I said before about not being able to read the room. And so here are just some quotes, connecting with students, how to connect individually, building community, not being able to read body language, bonding through a screen, how to make my lessons more interactive, bonding through a screen, again, there were two more of those, student engagement, there were about six of those, how to engage preschool kids, engagement, facilitating social interaction, inability to connect, connecting and engaging with students, establishing rapport with students through the online platform. Now, I think most people, when they hear those and think about them, they run into a brick wall because those are unquantifiable issues, right? How do you break down engagement and define it and fix it? It seems like it's too up in the air, it's too abstract, and so it becomes depressing. And if there's one thing that I have to say to today, it's that what I studied, like I'll get into my book in a second, but the stuff that I learned from studying these ancient Greeks is they actually had terminology for discussing that stuff and for getting purchase on it and helping people gain a sense of engagement and connection and rapport. And so for modern people, it's like this pie in the sky abstract thing that you can't do anything about. But in olden times, they really did have this whole language for describing it and ways for teaching you how to get it. So to make it make sense, let me go backwards. I mean, if you had ever talked to me about speech training, what I would have thought of is Dale Carnegie. And to me, like I said before, there's nothing geekier than the subject of speech training. So to me, what it means is it's confidence lessons for shy people. So it's this very superficial acting lesson to make you speak up and speak like an enthusiastic person who you may not actually feel like being. And so I had never, it was never on my radar as an interesting subject. And yet, of course, when you think about it, the subject of speech, I mean, the average American today speaks 16,000 to 20,000 words a day. And it is by far the most important activity that we do you know, everything to do with love or professional advancement or getting along with people or politics, it all has to do with how well you speak. So before I got into this project, I never properly marveled at the fact of how weird it is that we don't learn that anymore. We don't learn anything about speech. We go to school from five to whatever, 16 or 25, you know, depending. It's a lot of years and everything that we do is about reading and writing and math but it's almost 99% of it is about exchanging concepts on paper or on a screen. And I don't know about you, but I went to a fancy private high school and I had one very lame semester of communications class that was teaching me how to do a speech that we all had to do in front of the whole school. But the, all they were doing was preparing me for that one speech. They didn't teach me speech theory. They didn't teach me about the history of speech. They didn't embrace this subject of the main thing that I do and that you guys do as educators. And I would guess, I mean, raise your hand, anybody who's gotten any kind of speech training. I see one hand. I see two hands. Okay, I might not be seeing quite everybody, but considering that it's the most important thing that we do, it's the thing that decides whether people like you, whether you can maintain your relationships, whether people think you're smart, right? If you have a very high IQ, but you're terrible at speaking to people, people think you're dumb or difficult and they don't wanna be around you and you don't get promoted. So it's, it's, it's the same as being dumb. It's the same as, being, as having a terrible personality. And so for that reason, it always gets confused with your personality. So my big breakthrough, my big discovery with my book was to discover that once upon a time, it was treated as its own discipline. And so you guys as teachers, me as a writer, we all would have had years of public speaking instruction. And okay, let me go backwards. I discovered this completely by accident. I was doing a different project. I was interviewing people around the country talking about love. And I interviewed my cousin, Bill from Dyersville, Iowa, who was a recluse. He had lived in his parents' basement until he was 59 years old. And this guy had never had any friends, uh, never had gone to a bar to have a beer with someone. He'd never been on a date. And he was kind of the family curiosity. And we all thought he was really interesting, but weird. And 
So I interviewed him and the main thing that I wanted to find out was how in the world he had broken his isolation and talk to the woman who would eventually be his wife. And I assumed, I completely assumed that his answer would include a therapist and something psychiatric and meds, right? The problem that makes us not be able to speak well is some kind of anxiety, something with our childhood, something with low self-esteem, something with introversion. And what he said was that he had joined Toastmasters. And for anyone who doesn't know, Toastmasters is a huge nonprofit organization all around the world with about 360,000 members. And they are the world's largest organization devoted to teaching the art of public speaking. So that kind of rang a couple of my bells and I thought about it for a while and I did research on them and that led me to the ancient Greeks and, and how just how prized they, how cherished speech education was for them. So I, I went back and I discovered the history and I found it super fascinating. And I'll give you the brief, brief history of that because it does help explain what we all need to learn in the here and now. There are these forgotten principles that nobody knows anymore. And they're super easy and obvious if only you can receive them in a useful way. So imagine this, before democracy, there was no such thing as public speaking. The rulers could go speak to the plebes from time to time, but regular people couldn't go on a street corner and talk to each other. So they invent democracy and suddenly you have elections and trials and things like that where a lot of people now are suddenly speaking in front of groups of people. And immediately people realized that the best way to get rich and famous and powerful was to be good at speaking. So suddenly there's this gold rush on language and philosophers and teachers rush in and start plumbing the mysteries of language like why stories work better in three parts why it's helpful to use your voice this way or that way. They explore all of these different tricks you can do using verb tenses, and they're cool. If you want to blame someone, stick to the past tense. If you want to resolve a problem and eliminate tension, switch to the future tense. Um, I won't go into this now, but try it and report back to me. So they come up with all of this really handy stuff. Um, and they also have the same problem then as they do now, which is that evil people tend to be better at lying and doing, you know, pub using public speaking for manipulative purposes. And the good people always seem to be slower on that. We're too honest, we're too slow. Um, so people argue for a couple of decades about whether this new discipline of speech training is any good or not. And Plato, for example, hated it and thought that it was evil and that truth should speak for itself. And why would anyone who's good or honest need help learning how to speak better? So Aristotle, who was his student, agreed for a while. And then he jumped in and he said, no, 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 no. In a world where now everybody is using these tricks, we all need to learn how to use these tricks. So he does a typically Aristotelian treatment of public speaking and it's called the Ars Rhetorica. And so by this time, it's understood that when we speak to each other, never mind language and, and in our context, never mind Zoom and the technological problems, what we are really doing is trying to persuade one another. So as I'm talking to you, whatever I'm talking to you about, I don't want you to hang up. I don't want you to think I'm an idiot. I, I want certain things from you. There's never a time when I'm talking to you or you're talking to your students where you don't want something. And Aristotle says that basically, I, this is getting too far afield, I guess, but he says that um, things that are true and things that are good are easier to prove than their opposites. So if you find yourself unable to make your point or you're getting beaten by fast talkers or evil people, you have only yourself to blame. You should have studied rhetoric more. You should have studied how to make your case better. And it's a really daunting thing to say because he's basically saying that all problems can be solved or improved by learning how to do public speaking better. So basically it's discovered that knowing these skills makes people smarter. It's a good intellectual workout to learn these skills, but also that if you can't speak up for yourself in a crowded, noisy world with a lot of liars and a lot of crazy people and a lot of competition, you're going to lose out. So however smart you are, you need to learn this skill. And it becomes the 
primary component of education for the next 2000 years. So ancient education had three parts. There was the grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And rhetoric was by far the most important. And so kids had years and years of speech training and you learned all of this stuff before you went into other subjects that were considered kind of mere vocational skills like religion or architecture or the law. And it just was this assumption of ancient pedagogies that learning to interact with others and see when they're lying and see how they're making their case and make your own case better was like learning an operating system for how to deal with other people. So if you look at ancient pedagogies and all the way up until 1600, oh yeah, one more point to make my, my point. Until the year 1600, there were more books published about rhetoric than any other, any other subject except for Christianity. So when I say it was the biggest subject, that one statistic to me leaps out. This was the biggest deal in Western history. And if you look through the different teachers and the different ways that they described it, the word they use again and again is connection. This and Cicero, who I'm not going to get into, but he was an even bigger teacher than Aristotle. He called rhetoric the art of connected terms. So the art of becoming eloquent and becoming a good communicator was sifting through every single component of speech, whether it's the social stuff or your performance or language or language theory or what you're doing with your body. It was the art of connected terms, the art of figuring out how to connect with the person on the other side of the conversation from you. And so to go back to the feedback that I've heard from teachers, these issues of engagement and connection and rapport and all of these things, my point is that where we're now approaching these things as if we don't have tools for solving them back, you know, back in the day, they had these super specific tools for addressing them. So I want to go back to Aristotle and really, really do a very fast job on the principles of communication he formulated and then bring it back into the present day and quit talking about all this old stuff, which probably sounds kind of weird. Um, his book, by the way, is almost impossible to read and it took me 10 years to write my book. And that's because every single sentence from Aristotle took me about three years to unpack. And so by now I have this weird insight and familiarity with some of these concepts, but if they seem hard to grasp where they seem, for me, they almost seem like they're so obvious that they're not interesting and it's hard to realize how much is inside them. But I, at the risk of seeming like a huckster, I would say that if you memorize these three principles and bring them to the problems of teaching online, they will solve every single problem. Like I haven't run into a single communication problem that I can't solve by applying these three rules again and again until I figure out how to use them. So the first Aristotle chestnut is the audience is the beginning and the end of public speaking. And really the first time I read that, I was like, okay, done, that makes sense. The public, yeah, it's an important part of public speaking. And what he means is that if you break speech down into its constituent parts, which you can do in any number of ways, but let's say choosing your topic, where you wanna be in the frame or how you wanna be uh, a lot of your feedback indicated, like how long should we have the students be interacting? How long of a lecture is too much of a lecture? What's the right mix of this kind of interactivity or that kind of way of breaking up the class? All of it comes back to that one question. It's not what you think, it's what they need. It's not what you feel, it's what they respond to. And that one principle is so obvious and yet we never do it. I mean, I know it backwards and forwards and I still can't do it all the time. But when you're choosing which words to say, which examples to use to illustrate a concept, every single part of the speech, how long it should be. Go back to the audience is the beginning and the end of public speaking. The second big Aristotle chestnut is also so obvious that it seems almost trivial. In the middle of the Ars Rhetorica, which is written almost like a, an architectural blueprint, it's very, very, very clear and Aristotelian. This is what rhetoric is. This is why it's important. These are the parts that it comes in. Here's what you need to know. He goes off on this weird tangent about happiness. 
And he goes into this taxonomy of the different things that make people happy. So he talks about health and wealth and family and love and longevity and status and all of these things. And he goes into this really boring detail about why those things make us happy and what they look like and what they mean. And it took me about three years of staring at it to understand his point. And his point is that audiences of any kind, students or any other, listen to you for one reason, which is clues to their own happiness. So it doesn't mean that when you're teaching calculus that you have to pretend like, hey, kids, you know, learning this is gonna make you happy. But what it does mean is that if, when you are talking, you need to explain to people pretty often how and why what you're talking about is gonna benefit them and how it's gonna make them happy. If I am talking for too long about myself, if I went into a thing right now about my childhood and all the sad things that happened in my childhood that made me a bad public speaker, I'd have to try pretty hard to bring that around to how these Aristotelian principles are gonna help you teach your classes. It might be that it's helpful to you, but if I go there, I need to explain, here's why this is relevant. Here's why you should care. And I feel like people don't do that enough. I need to be able to explain at all times how I am talking for you, not for me. And we'll come back later in the Q&A and, and while we're talking about solutions to what that might look like in the real world. And the third Aristotelian principle is so complicated, I don't wanna get into it. And some of you have probably heard it, but he said that when we persuade people, we use three things. We use logos, pathos, and ethos. That means facts, emotions, and character. And so facts are pretty easy, and any of you who are teaching are basically transmitting a set of facts from your mind and experience to your students. But what, and then, you know, I'm sure there are days where you are joking or days where you have to act a little bit authoritative to instill a little bit of fear or discipline in them. Um, and you see this, of course, in all kinds of other speeches, people get the audience laughing or crying or doing whatever. But in the, the main germ of this rule is that what they're looking at is you and your ability to speak. And so if you're fumbling around or you're speaking unclearly, like sometimes it happens with everybody, oh my gosh, I just that. Like you lose them, they think less of you and you lose the connection. And so if your main value, your main, the, the main priority of your teaching is, of course, the teaching, you need to realize that your students are paying attention to all these other things, like their own happiness and you as a person. And what that means in real life, but also over, over virtual teaching is just your performance and your ability you know, to get the, the reflections out of your eyes and all of these things that are a pain in the butt. And so I guess the bad news is that any technological problems that you know how to solve, you really have to solve if you want the experience to be engaging and connected. And I think a lot of us don't do that. I'm particularly lazy about the technical stuff, even though I'm now embarking on this career as a guy who's talking about public speaking. And my God, I still hate to solve those kinds of problems. It's very, very hard to be 100% clear and 100% legible. And I wouldn't say, to anyone that they have to be 100% legible, but it is fixing the technical problems and helping the students navigate the technical problems at the beginning of a semester maybe, might be a great way to just put that off to the side and be done with it for the rest of the semester, you know, inshallah. Um, anyway, I wanted, to, I wanted to also talk about something else which is, which when I heard about different solutions that people were using, one of the things that came up a lot was, I might have to teach less of my subject and I might have to focus more on SEL issues and you know, social emotional learning. And I had started thinking about this before getting the feedback, but when I got that feedback, it really made me realize a kind of Buddhisty or Taoisty thing, which is the, the elephant in the middle of the room for all of us right now is this technology that's a big pain in the butt and we're all struggling with it. But what if we made the problems of using Zoom be 
a bigger part of the lesson. So all of these problems about student engagement, I already said that we could maybe improve them just by improving the connection, right? The more legible you are, the more clearly they can hear you, the more organized your talk is, the more your talk is organized in a way that is explicitly addressing their happiness and you're explaining its relevance to them, all of those things will make you more legible. But also what if you shifted the lesson a little bit and made it be more about how to zoom. And that sounds ridiculous, but if your subject is geography or math or something that doesn't seem explicitly about communication or social skills, is there a way to encourage the students to present their knowledge about it or speak about it using Zoom? And you use the other students and you use it as a teaching opportunity to teach them how to speak better. Because if the ancient Greeks were right, the ability to speak up is ultimately what we're all after here. That's the goal of education, to have students who are formed enough to have their own opinions, have good opinions, and be able to express them coherently. And so rather than allow ourselves to be shut down by this technological problem, what if it were like a laboratory, teaching students how to use it better? And number one, it's a tremendous way to be able to, uh, I don't want to say hide our own problems with using it, but it's a way to bring the students in on the same level of the struggles that we're having. Okay, let's pretend like you're the presenter for a minute. Let's see how well you do. Let's encourage all of us to do this Zoom thing together. And you can have the students critique each other and be more involved and have breakout rooms or I don't, I need to find out in the last part of this sort of how some of you are implementing some of the suggestions you got. But my basic idea here is just, can we use this problem as the teaching example itself? Can we make all the subjects we teach be a bit more rhetorical, just like they did back in the day in the ancient Greeks, you know, when this was the number one subject. So I want to let you guys talk more and hear myself talk a little bit less and, and get to the solutions that I heard from a lot of people. Um, because in the same way that the complaints pointed to a couple of common problems, the solutions mostly pointed to common solutions as well. Uh, one teacher said that he formed a club with the students where they could talk about books that they've read. A couple of people suggested making individual phone calls to students and their families and calling on every student in class during the class, using Google Docs to elicit feedback from the students through the comments section, making sure to have like an icebreaker or some conversation time at the beginning of each class. And again, worrying less about skill attainment and worrying less about the original lesson plan and thinking more about SEL issues. Breaking students into smaller group, encouraging individualized written feedback, which facilitated further dialogue, making myself more animated, sometimes with props, and movement to keep kids engaged, utilizing the yes, no icons on Zoom, cutting back on work and focusing, again, more on the emotional stuff, Lots of polling, lots of Google Docs to simulate a private tutoring experience. Icebreaker exercises, reduce lecture, reduce lecture, reduce lecture, interactivity. And finally, taking two weeks at the beginning of class to build community. So what, I, what I've been doing since Leading up to the, the publication of my book, I've been asked to speak at all kinds of different companies and different organizations to apply these old school Greek skills to the problems that each kind of company or industry is having. And what I keep finding is that I am the last person who knows your solutions as well as you do. You guys individually have probably each figured out a couple of things that work and what is missing is a kind of a document that has the best practices where you can all learn from each other. You know, you guys talking about these things is going to be better than me talking about it. All I can do is repeat this old school Greek stuff 
of just focus on their happiness, focus on the audience, focus on how well you are in control of your presentation of the overall class. But I think I'd like to stop talking right now and, and start answering some of the questions here, but also if, if the gods of Zoom allow us, maybe open this up to where some of you can speak to some of the questions, all right? So for now, I'm just gonna say thanks very much for letting me talk to you. Thank you, John. I think uh, this group probably knows the drill that uh, when you have a question, just uh, unmute your mic and make sure you're remuted when you're done, but go ahead. This is Amy. I teach a uh, UC Berkeley freshman and um, actually what just, uh, what we all just experienced actually leads me to the question of uh, any tips on what to do when this happens in our class? Oh, no questions? Well, you know what, you know what? Quiet time. I know how to handle it in person, but when it's on the screen, it feels even heavier. So any tips, welcome. Thanks. You know what I keep saying to people, and I really need to up my game, as Dave Chappelle would say, um, because before I used to give speeches, I was terrified. I would work on a book for years, and then I would give a speech to some incredibly important audience. And I was never the worst public speaker, but I was never better than like B minus on a really good day, C to C minus would be average, C minus. And I would almost want to kill myself because I felt so bad for not representing myself. I wasted everyone's time. I wasn't like normally in real life, I'm funny and I'm interesting. And in public speaking, I was just always super boring. And I think anybody who would come to see the august author of whatever, whatever book I had just written would probably be disappointed. So what I've learned with all of this study of speech and speech training and stuff is you really anyone can eliminate that it has nothing to do with your horrible childhood or your anxieties or your bad you know your speech anxiety it's just nonsense it's an artistic skill that we were never taught and if we were taught it and if we practiced it we would all get much much better at it and so the answer that i have for every single question like you just asked is preparation 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 there is almost no problem that you can't prepare for. So again, to think about the audience as the beginning and the end of public speaking. Okay, students are a group of people who are fully capable of just being silent when you ask that question. So what's the fix? What can you leap in with? It's, the answer is figuring it out in advance and having, having something scripted or a device for encouraging a competition or picking on one of them anyway, unless that's cruel and unusual punishment these days. I don't know what, what's permitted or not. But it's just, it is thinking through the problem in advance. That's what the audience is the beginning and the end of public speaking really, really means. I, I like to just continue that discussion. Um, so here are a few ideas. One is, uh, I, I, I know we're all uncomfortable with silence, um, whether online or in person, if you, um, you know, again, these are not, these are either or, you know, maybe and, um, but allowing the light and the silence, sometimes uh, the next time the students might learn to ask a question, uh, if it's uncomfortable for them. Another would be, be prepared with a question. Um, you know, turn it back to them. Um, there was a third one, and now I can't remember what it is before I unmute it myself, but those are two ideas. I think that maybe, I mean, if you had a list of just sort of rhetorical questions you could ask any time, I wonder if that would work. Just conversation starters. I just remembered the, the third thing. Um, at the school I taught last year, the students were um, trained since freshmen to um, learn to ask questions and asking questions, knowing what questions to ask was just really important. So they were already kind of, you know, prepped to do that. So that's definitely going to take some prep on your part and on the school's part just encouraging students to learn to ask questions. Jennifer asked, can anyone share a great icebreaker? Do any of you, have any of you used icebreakers or do any of you 
start your class with any kind of general conversation as well, a way I, of opening things up? I think a lot of it's going to depend on the age of the students you're dealing with. I get the feeling that we have a wide range of ages that we're teaching here. Uh, I teach adults at UC Extension and I teach the horrible subject of finance. Um, and um, I usually start, when I start the class, even when I'm there in person, I ask them what they think finance is. Uh, and, you know, I realize a lot of them are there just because they have to take the course to meet a certificate requirement. But um, having them tell me what they think finance is, is a good way to get people talking. Uh, and then we can go on from there. Does anyone have any, any, oh look, somebody posted something with 25 online icebreakers. I mean, I do these oral history books. I'll interview hundreds of people about the same subject. And when I am in my groove, I am so much better at that than when I'm not. So a little bit of it is a mental exercise of just thinking, okay, how can I respond to whatever comes up or how can I just you know, come up with something more than just, uh, has, you know, what about that weather today? Um, but I feel like the more I use that muscle, the better I am at it. You know, Bryce, that's a very green shirt you have today. What's, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just like, let's talk about different kinds of green. I don't know. This um, summer, I uh, did a lot of work with um, students, and I would um, just go around my day, around my world, and take some interesting photographs of things. And I would just put the photographs up and ask kids um, what they, what we could talk about, what questions we could ask about the photograph, what did they notice about the photograph. And the longer we'd stare at the photograph, the more interesting things we'd find in the photograph. So um, depending on your subject, I'm, I'm not saying the woman who's teaching finance, you don't necessarily need to bring in uh, actual actuarial tables or anything like that, but just even um, a picture of some plants from outside and talk about how could you talk about that through the lens of finance and just kind of breaks the ice and brings the subject to the top and gets people to start talking about something in a really non-threatening, gentle way. Just an idea. You know, I want to cut back to the ancient Greeks for a second because the the definition for shyness back in their day had no emotional component to it. It was defined as perplexity, as if you were trapped in a conversational situation and you did not know the artistic path out of that trap. But they truly did not consider it to be a psychological trait. It was an artistic, it was a deficit of artistic skills. And so the one thing I want to bring back to every single one of these problems is that there is an artistic solution to all of these problems. Now, it might not be easy and it might not be fun getting there and it might be a zillion hours of work to get there. But if your goal is this thing of connection and engagement, there's a big long list of tricks to get there that will, if, you know, by the time you learn them all, we'll be over the pandemic and dealing with some other problem probably. But... But for now, I just, the point is that it's not hopeless or without solution. Someone wrote and said, the speaker in the physical classroom to some degree has insight about and control over what is happening in that space. The instructor on Zoom is teaching to an audience in a less knowable context. How do you reconcile that? Well, again, you all in your Feedback and other educators I've talked to, it's all about oh, how do you elicit more feedback? How can you break the class into something where students have a chance to feedback more often? Do they have a chance to feedback through the chat? Do you want that? Do you give them the option of just thumbs up and thumbs down? Yes, no. I know that for me, if I don't have some feedback, it's a nightmare and I don't even know I mean, I want to do, you know, someone else mentioned polling. I like to poll a lot. What would be most helpful for you? Here's the basic deal, but what are you most interested in? And then kind of reconciling them. I teach ESL to adult immigrants. Um, so I use a lot of icebreakers, but I don't use it the way 
uh, that is normally perceived, you know, like icebreaker should be something very light. I do just the opposite. I offer topics that are thought provoke, uh, you know, thought provoking and sometimes provocative too. Uh, so if we just take an example of, uh, you know, teaching finance, which is something that I don't do, but I would probably offer some, you know, um, topic of, for example, what, are, what is the lifestyle of Warren Buffett? Or another thing that I use in my ESL classes, for example, the frugal millionaire, there was a very short video on Yahoo about a guy who lived a very, you know, a careful life who didn't have a family or anybody, you know, no friends, no family, no obligations, just, you know, saving money for his own um, prosperity. So, you know, these kind of issues that are thought provoking and because th these are also meaningful and, and students engage in this very easily because, you know, again, as you mentioned already, you know, these kind of brings back to connecting with the audience who's looking for happiness, right? So like, does money buy happiness? That's the issue that we're exploring. So I would say just, you know, any topic that, that is uh, meaningful and uh, life relevant will work out really well. That's a great, that's a great answer. Um, the Greeks had this several year long public speaking curricula known as the pro gymnasmata. And a couple things about it that were really interesting. Number one, the first exercise was so easy that absolutely everyone could accomplish it. And so then forevermore afterwards, no one could say, oh, I have speech anxiety, I can't do this. Every single student was now on board and on the trajectory with the other students. And they would then proceed to reading something very, a very short story, you know, half a paragraph, and then memorizing that story, and then doing short stories where they have to act out voices. And as they're acting out voices, they start to learn, well, this is what a good character sounds like. This is what an evil character sounds like. This is what a young character or an old character sounds like. These, this is the tone of voice you use at the beginning of a story and the end of the story. Why do you need to change your voice, right? The information is the same. So why do you need to change your voice? Anyway, when they wanted to encourage, and encourage them to start authoring their own opinions, they would say, great, write a speech praising someone or something that you love. And then they would say, write a speech condemning something that you hate. And I've used that with students, and it's the best. It is the best, 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 because everybody loves or hates something. And if you get them talking about what they hate or love and then start teaching how to do that better, and you let the other students in to critique it and add or subtract, it's amazing. It gets even the shyest person going. Okay, so somebody wrote in and said, here's some icebreakers with just one student at a time. I found it helpful to ask four key questions at the start of every session. One, what have you enjoyed recently? Two, what has been a recent pain or difficulty for you? Three, what is something that you just did? Four, what do you plan to do later that you will enjoy? So all of these kind of questions really do follow that thing of, of the audience is the beginning and the end of public speaking and speaking to their happiness. Everyone loves to talk about themselves. Well, I take that back, not everyone, but most people when they feel like talking and they get over whatever speech anxiety they might have are pretty comfortable talking about themselves. Anyway, more questions. I would love to have more questions. Um, just to do a poll, do you, how many people, how many people use lighting when they're, use lighting or a microphone to make themselves more legible when they teach? Just um, raise hands, please. I mean, for me, the idea of doing any of that would have been a non-starter. And now I just feel like, guess what? We are all public speakers now. So if the lighting is making it 10% harder to connect with people, guess what? 
your problem of student engagement is pretty easily solved. It's not an emotional problem, it's a technical problem. If a bigger, better microphone will make your voice warmer and easier to hear, especially with students who have a lot going on in their home, guess what? You just increased your ability to connect and engage. You know, so all of these little technical fixes, which again, like I am the most resistant person in the world to all of this stuff. Um, but I'm just getting over and realizing we are all public speakers now. And so these old, and even, even some of the newer, like Dale Carnegie level stuff about how to do it better is just, is helpful stuff. You know, what's the proper distance from the screen? Too close and you look weird, too far and you're dwarfed by the space around you. I think people with really chaotic backgrounds that can be kind of distracting to students, but. John, we, we have about three more minutes. I wonder if you could draw a conclusion uh, to this around a question that was asked on the survey and had to do more with students. Um, you, and the question basically is, is there anything about this historical moment about COVID and how we're teaching now that does or should change what we expect from students? Well, I think in the sense that we are all public speakers now, if the ancient Greeks had this idea that we are all public speakers, you know, 2,400 years before COVID, I think it would be, it would behoove us to bring back this idea, like we need to be preparing students to talk and to express themselves, you know, and if they're pre-COVID or post-COVID, if this is all they know how to do and they don't know how to do any of this, their lives are gonna be horrible. I mean, I open up when I teach students, I say, basically, if you learn this skill, your lives might be decent. And if you don't learn this skill, you'll be depressed and you'll be an underachiever for your whole life and your relationships will be bad. And the first time I said that, I was just being flip and I was joking. And now I say it and I'm completely serious. So while we are all learning how to be public speakers because of COVID, and the students, I think, are also having to learn that. I think these skills translate way beyond COVID. And there's no one who would be less happy knowing these skills. So if you want to cut to the heart of, you know, SEL learning, this is it. This is the skill set. And one thing I want at the Eventbrite page, we're going to somehow set something up so that people can keep sharing ideas. Because really, I'm wonderful, but you guys are more wonderful, and your solutions for all of this are going to be a lot more helpful. And so it seems like it would be really useful, and maybe we could start something that gets shared with teachers all over, a kind of best practices sheet that could be circulated and be used to really help people who are floundering. So that's probably as much time as we have. Thanks very much, Stephen, and thanks to all of you for coming. Thank you, John. Um, and I thank all of you also for coming. We would uh, give you applause if we had our mute off and could do so at this point. Um, but hands in the air and wave and, uh, and thank you. And I ask all of you to take a look at our uh, page and see other events you can attend soon. We loved having you here and your insights were really important. Um, and really the best to you this week and next week and the, the intense and important work you have ahead of you as educators. Um, we're all counting on you, so keep up the good work, and thank you for joining us.